Dr. Robert Kaler, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Of course, FDA Commissioner. This is not your first go-round as FDA Commissioner. I I'm wondering if you can talk about the difference these days compared to your first go-round. Well, you know, the first time um, I'd been a civil servant for a year before becoming commissioner, so it wasn't all new, but being the commissioner was a new um, place to be in terms of the pressure that you're under and the news every day and <clears throat> being the target for a lot of things that are going wrong in society. It sort of comes to rest uh, in the FDA, but it was relatively genteel compared to what I'm experiencing this time around. I'd say our country is very divided. Um, the amount of animosity in the air is much greater and it makes it harder. On the other hand, I know my way around and so I feel very good about finishing some things that were underway or at least getting the ball further down the field. Finishing might be a little um, overly optimistic. <laughs> it's interesting that you use the sports analogy. One of the things that you often like to talk about and I'd like to ask you about is usually we think of FDA in one lane and CMS in another lane when it comes to the approval of drugs and then the coverage of drugs. But these days it seems as though FDA and CMS have to work more in concert because we have some breakthrough drugs that are coming through. I, I think about particularly when it comes to Alzheimer's where you made an accelerated approval and CMS said we're only going to cover with evidence, only with people who are continuing trials. Of course we're talking about Lakembi which is up for full approval, uh, we believe next month, right? Well, I can't give dates, but the advisory committee has met and there was a unanimous opinion on it. So there are a lot of things we have to consider that go beyond just the data that's in a packet. You know, manufacturing is very important, et cetera. So we'll see, can't give an exact date. And what is your thought on some of the parameters that CMS is placing on these drugs that tackle amyloid plaque? It seems to be a different lane, a special category compared to other drugs that you've approved. Well, let, let's take a step back. This is the Ideas Festival, so let's, let's look at the big picture. I, I, um, part of uh, my belief is, and, and you mentioned it this way, if you ask the question, how can we be the world's greatest innovators in medical products and have the world's safest food, according to The Economist, and know so much about nutrition, and yet our health outcomes are essentially the worst of any high-income country, and we're losing ground by the day. About an average five-year difference in life expectancy. We're dying much earlier, and it's seven and a half years less than the leading countries now. I think the primary issue is what's been called suboptimization, and it's gotten to be this way, and, and some of the other things we're gonna talk about, I'll point out how I think it's a, the core issue there too. We're all taught now, um, a lot of MBA schools have focused on this, to optimize our part of the equation. And then there's a, a, an assumption that if each component is optimized, somehow the sum will be um, greater than, uh, the whole will be greater than the sum of the parts. In fact, what we're producing is a system where the whole is less than the sum of the parts. Everywhere I go for the FDA's role, no one's arguing with me that U.S. is number one in innovation in producing medical products for the world. And the rest of the world benefits from our investment in that. And yet we have these bad health outcomes. It's not all due to medical product use, but it's part of the equation. And so the idea that FDA should optimize its little lane and CMS should optimize its big lane, but separate lane, I think is a very flawed way to look um, at what our society needs. But now, would you then think about approving a drug and how much it costs? Does no, that no, no. So, uh, so then it gets into the nuances, which are really important here. You know, our uh, standard is safe and effective, and it should stay that way. But it's safe and effective uh, for adequate and well-controlled clinical trials in a particular population for a particular use. Then um, it goes over the transom in the past to CMS, which then has to say, does that mean um, uh, necessary? 
and um, for the whole population, everyone, the, the vast, you know, and often the trials are not huge. Fortunately, the Alzheimer's trials now um, are fairly large, but they're also not huge. And so we have different mandates. CMS shouldn't tell us what's safe and effective, and, and we shouldn't tell CMS what's reasonable and necessary. Um, but we should talk to each other, and you know, you mentioned the baton handoff. It's the analogy I like because you know, we're not asking CMS to run our lap, and they're not asking us to run their lap, but we at least ought to have a situation rather than our dropping the baton and have them figure out what to do with it. We ought to be you know, running those, that last part of our lap and hand off a smooth baton to CMS, and that means better design of clinical trials, producing better data about diverse populations in the U.S., um, and it means that there's a lot of evidence that needs to be generated post-market. So um, there's been a lot of controversy, and um, people like to see, you know, food fights as part <laughs> of the news and all that. But that's not what's going on internally. We're having serious discussions about how do we keep our mandate separate but have uh, a smoother handoff so that it's better for the American people. You're well aware that in uh, European societies where life expectancy is much longer, and I'm not saying that's the only reason, but they have a tech assessment, which is done by government in the middle of all this, which is really a look at cost effectiveness. And I think that whole area, we, it's, it's a nascent area of science that we've not done the best job with. How can we do it in this country? We don't have one <laughs> electronic health record which would allow you to look at longitudinally what happens with everyone who has been prescribed this drug. Did I hear you say we're sub-optimized in this <laughs> I, country? <laughs> where you, you, you mentioned to me Mount Sinai and Columbia Presbyterian in New York, and I, I have one of my mentees is just going to be CEO of, um, uh, of Cornell, uh, which is in that mix too. You can't get your scans exchanged between the two. Why is that? It's not because you got bad people, it's because there's financial benefit of holding on to things. There's silos, the and, and for a lot of them, sometimes to improving the tech, they'd rather put it into a fancy new, you know, machine yeah. rather than. Oh, oh, that's true, but let, you know, I worked at Alphabet for five years. This is not technically an issue. This is an issue of culture holding on to things and trying to have proprietary advantage in a health system that's essentially, whether it's not-for-profit or not, is looking at the bottom line. And so we've got to overcome it, and I'm not proposing that we become a European system, but we're going to have to come up with an American solution to this problem because you, you can no longer argue that people are not suffering because of the sub-optimization. Our results are inferior to other high-income countries. And there are many other reasons. I'm not saying this is the only one. So the Alzheimer's drugs are really important. And you know the way it started was with an accelerated approval, which also led to a lot of arguments and discussions because um, an accelerated approval is an approval by the FDA, but it's based on an unvalidated um, biomarker um, where the FDA is charged with deciding it, whether it's reasonably likely that the benefits outweigh the risks. That's different than proven that the benefits outweigh the risk based on hard empirical And you feel data. that's an, is that an important step? Because there are some people who argue the FDA moves too fast on some things, but then of course there are lots of people who say <laughs> the FDA moves too slowly. In fact, there's going to be a debate I, on that later this week. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like we're essentially in the right place, which means everybody's unhappy. And, <laughs> um, I, you know, it's, it's on the record. My mom was a great beneficiary of accelerated approval when she had multiple myeloma. And the American people have spoken through the laws. I mean, we're not, this is not FDA making up accelerated approval. Congress passed a set of laws that instruct us to do this because it's in the American personality, basically, to take more risk um, on new things, particularly when someone feels threatened by, like, a terminal illness for which there's no available treatment. Um, some societies may say, well, wait and see. In America, the laws say um, you need to consider the science behind it and make your best judgment. And I think one of the important things about the American system, this judgment is made by full-time civil servants who have no financial conflict of interest. So 
All the palace intrigue, I think, is palace intrigue um, silliness. But um, these are hard decisions, and they can all, you know, by the nature of the decision, you're saying there's going to be more uncertainty. And so then it really is incumbent upon the system to generate the evidence. And, you know, for example, you say, well, the companies need to do it. And I agree, we have new laws, as you know now, to um, hold the companies to the standard of getting the studies done. But when I met with America's health insurance plans, they were asking me, why don't you get these companies to do their studies? You know my question to them? What are you doing to help them get the studies done? It's in the interest of your uh, beneficiaries to, to know the answer, but you're actually making it hard for them. Because talk to a clinical investigator in the American system now and ask them what the problems are in getting, getting studies done. One of the things, I was at a conference last week and there were a number of executives from, from biotech companies, small companies, and they say the IRA, you, were t you talk about law, is now making them have to rethink how they invest and how they pursue their trials, particularly with this issue of small molecule drugs becoming eligible for the price negotiation after just nine years. The FDA is working with CMS on trying to figure out these parameters, obviously brand new, it's just starting this year. How do you, how are you helping them to try to figure out what to target and how to, you know, you, what criteria to use? I feel like I always have to give my disclaimers here. And <laughs> with regard to the last discussion in this one there, when we're in FDA's lane, then I am the leader and I'm accountable for my opinions um, need to be expressed either as policies or a place where it's not a policy. When you start getting in to someone else's business, um, I would just say I have a seat at the HHS leadership table. Um, there was a good discussion last night, I felt, by the HHS uh, bosses over time about how that uh, works. And I also was a practicing clinician for 35 years and an executive in a health system, and I've worked in pharma and device companies and IT companies. So I feel like, um, so we get in, uh, we get uh, into the um, realm of opinion here. Um, and what I would say is, uh, first of all, my opinion is the prices of innovator drugs are too high. I said that last week, people got mad at me, some people. I, I don't know, you look at a third of cancer patients, a third of heart failure patients don't finish their medicines and give us a reason they can't afford it. Well, it's fair to say many, sometimes people are making bad decisions about what they pay for and not, but um, I just think it's hard to argue that our current pricing system is right. So IRA is an effort, um, there many other things in IRA, but part of it is to try to deal with that. But when you pass a massive legislative thing like that, it's gonna need adjustment you know, we'll learn as we go. And I think the opinions of the industry about small molecules are well known. I, I'm not gonna tell you what I think about that, but um, most of our work with CMS is what you would call technical assistance. That is they, for example, they're gonna use real world evidence in the negotiation. So the question of what is high quality real world ev evidence is Where something. Where do you get that? Yeah, we've done a lot of work on that. And so, you know, we're, um, discussing that, the question of how you categorize the drugs that are up for negotiation, not as simple as you would think. And companies do have tricks that um, smart lawyers can use to like name a drug something else or give it a different dose and call it something new. Um, and so but they you have also to think argue, all that through. Not to get into the finer points, but I think about you approve a drug for one thing, but then you discover that there are also benefits somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, let's take Botox, right? Originally just to make your forehead smooth, but it's actually really helpful for people with migraines, yeah. which is not something that they talked about initially when it was approved. Sure, and that goes on almost forever. Just uh, yesterday, Colchicine was approved for prevention of cardiac events. Right. It's as old, you know, 40-year-old drug used for gout now in other inflammatory situations now, you know, no one, we thought it was kind of a dangerous drug, but in large clinical trials, it looks highly effective. I, these things are all in play, but to argue that the system is working now, given what we're seeing in our national statistics and the skyrocketing of costs, um, $4.3 trillion 
a year on healthcare with the results that we're getting. We gotta try something different. And I, I'm, I would be the last to say IRA is perfect, but I'd also say, you know, we need to make it as good as it can be. And if things need to be adjusted, I'll certainly be an advocate for adjustments within the administration. One of the other issues you talked about, uh, cancer drugs, and we are seeing large shortages of some of these drugs, and some of them are now generic, and yet they can't seem to manufacture enough. The National Comprehensive Cancer Network found 93% of cancer centers are reporting shortages of carboplatin, 70% are reporting shortages of cisplatin, and those are widely used. What are you seeing, and how can this be improved? I, um, this is really painful, because who would have thought, we're talking about generic drugs, um, they're cheap, and, and that was a beautiful part of the, I think this is a, you know, legislation that really worked uh, primarily in that 90% of prescriptions are now generic, and, you know, uh, I have hypertension and hyperlipidemia. I pay almost nothing for those drugs, and they're highly effective. That's a great thing, but what's, you know, dare I bring up suboptimization again? <laughs> I mean, what's happened is, um, the hospitals and health systems banded together and formed group purchasing organizations to negotiate the lowest prices possible. And then now we have a, a, a small set of very powerful uh, distributors, wholesalers, who are also in this game in the middle. Um, and then you have the, the people actually making the generic drugs out here. And the price has gotten so low that the, co that the price they get for the drugs for at least half of the generic drugs is less than the cost of making them. Now, I don't know about you, I, I would doubt if your network would, CEO would go into the business if you were guaranteed to lose money um, on what you're doing. And everyone is blaming everyone else. And, you know, FDA has been producing reports about this. This is not new, this is 20 yeah. years old. It's just really hit the, the, this Apparently critical cancer. it's been cancer. like a 10-year peak right now. Yeah. And um, uh, it, it's going to need systemic reform. There are a lot of things that we can do better at FDA. We're doing those. We need better information. But in essence, that's just plugging the holes. The fundamental problem is the economics of the system because the hospitals are driven to optimize their financial situation. The manufacturers are actually in the generic drug space, very different than innovator drugs. Remember, they're not protected by patents. So if a new manufacturer comes in and offers a lower price, uh, people jump to that and these guys go out of business. Innovator so drugs are So what is FDA protecting. doing in the interim right now? You're allowing for importation from other countries? Every time we see an impending shortage and we're averting about 250 shortages a year right now, still we end up with 30 to 40 that go into real shortage. So. Um, we scurry around and talk to everybody we can find and get people who are normally competitors to share information. So in this case of, you know, this very critical drug, cisplatin, we're actually using a Chinese company that um, has sold other drugs in the U.S. but was not selling cisplatin. They were making it. And then we have to put all kind of special measures in place because we don't have the usual quality stuff. So we have to actually measure everything as it comes into market. So. Uh, the good news is I think everybody from the White House to Senator Schumer yesterday made a big statement. Uh, the Republican members of the House, everybody wants to do something about this. So, but it's going to take a readjustment of the economics of the model. And in addition to suboptimization, at some risk, let me just say, <laughs> as a longtime clinician, uh, what I'm seeing across the board in U.S. healthcare is the middle people are getting larger and larger the administrators, the people moving things around, the people actually either making the products or the people delivering the service, the frontline clinicians are getting really seriously um, squeezed and morally injured right now because um, we, we've got to reallocate so that we have a flatter system that better aligns the people who are actually making the products that are useful and the people that are needed to deliver them. So it's a sort of interesting problem on the one hand we need drugs to be less expensive, but for the manufacturers, too inexpensive right. is a problem as well. And, and in, you know, in normal markets, like if I was selling you tennis shoes and, and you said, I'll pay you 10 bucks, and I said, it cost me 12, um, you'd say, okay, I'll pay you 
14 or something to keep me in business. That hasn't happened here because everyone is optimizing their own situation. No one is paying has been willing to pay attention to what's a reasonable price. And this also brings up the um, offshoring, which is a very a big issue of national security. Um, American labor is more expensive and American environmental restrictions are more severe than many other countries. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but the end result is if you're running a business, you move it to a lower cost, less restrictive country. And, um, you know, we got real national security concerns about what could happen given the amount of international strife now. But if you want to move it back in the U.S., you can't pay the prices of labor that uh, exist in countries like um, India, which is going to be one of our most valuable partners. So I'm not saying anything bad about India. <laughs> Shouldn't today, especially. And they got 1.6 <laughs> billion people. They need a robust yeah. industry. But if we're going to onshore this, it's got to be at a price that's – and it's critical that people remember the innovator industry and the generic industries are really um, separate industries now. They have very different economic um, drivers. I wanted to ask you about uh, a deadline you're facing tomorrow. You had um, four dozen members of Congress, uh, bipartisan, urging you to act on e-cigarette pre-market applications, and they would like a response by tomorrow, June 23rd. What can you tell us on why this final rule and these approvals What's taken so long, and what action are you going to take? This is something that isn't just bipartisan, but I hear from a lot of parents. They're very um, concerned about this. Well, parents should be concerned. Um, so let me start at the top. Um, most important is getting rid of combustible tobacco. We're still going to lose almost 500,000 Americans uh, to the consequences of combustible tobacco this year. And so uh, we are seeing significant declines in use of combustible tobacco, but we're now left with a very hardcore group of people. If you look at people who are currently using combustible tobacco, um, they're not typically your wealthy college graduate um, kinds of people. They're people who have other issues Although in I life. Although I know plenty of them who still they're, do. They're addicted. They're, and and they're, they're addicted. But if you look at the statistics, a uh, very high rate of living alone, very high rate of uninsured, very high rate of serious mental illness, for example. And so, um, this is a group that's going to need a lot of a special attention now. And so we have uh, rules that we'll finalize this year on menthol and um, flavored cigars and trying to re and we're hoping to put forth a rule on lowering the amount of nicotine. Well, that's going to drive people to try to stop again. Almost everyone who uses combustible tobacco now wants to stop. All right, so in comes um, e-cigarettes and vaping. Now, I describe 2016 for me as like a dream year when it came to this issue because we were thinking lofty thoughts and devising rules and uh, regulations and strategies, but we didn't have enforcement. We were enforcing on combustible tobacco at that time, but vaping was just really getting started. Now I come back uh, this year, no one that I know expected we would get 27 million applications for vaping products. Again, think about that, 27 million. This is an enormous industry. It's very locally, uh, a lot of mom and pop uh, kitchens uh, hiring 10 or 15 people, very important um, economically the way a lot of people see it. But so um, we had to do a lot of restructuring of the way we just handle the applications because there's so, um, you know, so many of them. And we're 99%, actually 99 plus percent through, but not 100%. Um, and so we'll be uh, responding to Congress on that. But um, stay tuned uh, this week, and we're obviously in the middle of this week, you'll see some interesting things that happen on the enforcement front that I can't uh, mention yet, but you'll see soon. Um, but what, it, what can you do? With these companies, if you're well, talking about mom and pops, and you're talking about someone, essentially, if they change a flavor, does that become a, a new, new product? product? And um, these lawyers that work on the other side on this are <laughs> phenomenal lawyers. So every th move we make is contested in court. And I don't need to tell you that our current courts are um, oriented towards um, individual freedom over uh, public health. 
And you know, that's not true across the board, but court shopping has become a fine art now. And so um, this is very difficult. Plus, we're, you know, um, we can't take dramatic enforcement without agreement of the Department of Justice. Hmm. And that's come up in the, we did a whole review of all this because it was so worrisome last year that the Reagan Udall Foundation did. And so um, it's, it's not easy. We, we can't walk into every uh, vape shop. If you just walk down the street in any place in America, you'll see a bunch. We can't walk in and seize all the products. We have to prove that it's illegal. They have a right to contest in court. We have a limited number of lawyers. I'll just say there are many excuses, um, but we all recognize this is a serious problem. We may need um, some new laws, if, um, but Congress is divided on all these things. Um, in our appropriations markup from the House, it instructed us not to work on menthol and um, uh, flavored cigars. So, um, but you'll see, we, we are finding that when we send ugly letters and notify the public that there is a response of the industry, it's not perfect. So stay tuned for more of that kind of enforcement. So you said you're 99% through the applications. Will we see some actual approvals, denials this oh, year? Yeah, oh, uh, yeah, millions of products have been denied. <laughs> <laughs> and there are only 23 vaping products that have been approved at this point. Because the standard that Congress gave us, which I think is the right standard, is um, what's the risk to youth versus the benefits to adults who are currently smoking um, who, uh, where the vaping is lower risk than combustible tobacco. And we're going to be working a lot on de de defining that standard better because it's not like an equation numerator and denominator with the same terms. Um, and, and you can't easily do, you know, you need long-term epidemiologic studies to have the evidence you'd like to have. But we're getting better and better at defining when that standard is met. I'd love to see better studies on um, how to get people off of combustible tobacco, what the role of vaping is. And if you look at the science of what's in the vaping product in terms, you know, the tar, and, uh, the tar part of um, combustible tobacco is not there, but there are chemicals that I have I wonder effects. about that. I, I mean, I, having, my dad died of lung cancer. He was a three pack a day smoker. And when I look at people, I just always think, what are you putting in your lungs? Do you even know what you're putting in your lungs and what's that doing? Do we have any sense of, of the impact? Right now, what we have are a lot of toxicological studies. And you remember we had that one outbreak of um, vaping-associated acute lung injury that went away because it was really due to contamination of product. Um, what, what we have now are just short-term studies and, and pathological studies that are done in animals and um, looking at the residua in experimental situations, but we're going to need long-term follow-up to know. And we have that um, difficult question ahead of us, too. If smoking marijuana is legal, which also has its lung-related issues over time, um, can we say that vaping should be completely illegal? Right now, it's not in our power to make vaping completely illegal. We have to weigh each application as it comes in. But you can make it illegal for people under 18? It is illegal for people. It's illegal to sell to people under 18. That doesn't mean that they don't get their hands on it. Well, that's as old as uh, America. <laughs> I got a son who started smoking when he was 12 in North Carolina by walking down to the local 7-Eleven with his buddies. And, you know, you don't need to tell me that nicotine addiction is uh, horrible. You, you, um, I don't think most people realize how severe nicotine addiction is. It doesn't, you know, it's not like you use nicotine and terrible things happen to you, but you can't stop using it because when you stop, your receptors in your brain are crying out for nicotine and it makes it hard to do other things. Although we just saw a study that Ozempic, the semiglutide, which apparently makes you not hungry, potentially could also work with other issues as well in your brain. Yeah, you know, you talked about Alzheimer's drugs. I think the other group of drugs to really look at now are the weight loss drugs. Um, and, you know, I always have to say here, we need more evidence. The evidence has got to come in. But so far, 
And, and I also have to acknowledge that I was the PI on one of the very early large studies of uh, the GLP-1 agonists, as they're called. Um, and so I've been working on this a long time. But uh, so regulatory decisions are not made by the commissioner. They're made by uh, people that are full-time civil servants. Um, but it looks like, um, you know, people lose weight. Um, their um, lipids and blood pressure gets better. Their physique gets better. Um, and so far, it looks like major adverse events are very manageable and um, not too bad. But we need, we need more data. There's some big studies in people who are obese without diabetes. Right now, right. they're approved for diabetes and some for weight loss. And there's something like 15 new compounds uh, dealing with these pathways. I mean, I sort of love the biology because we used to think it's just willpower. Now we know your gut is actually telling your brain right. what to do. Well, and for people with metabolic syndrome, it's hard to reset that. It's almost impossible, I think, we've seen. I mean, some I mean, people can do could it. Could this become like a statin for some people, something that they would well, just, when they get to that stage, they'd have to take it forever? Well, let's see what the data show. But um, right now, uh, it's over half of Medicare um, recipients are obese, not just overweight, but obese. And if you look at the consequences of that in terms of vascular disease, cancer, um, orthopedic injuries, it goes on and on. So this is going to be an area uh, we're also talking a lot with CMS about, because right now CMS is prohibited from covering weight loss drugs. Right. Um, and they're going to have to get creative, because if you combine Alzheimer's and weight loss and you covered everybody who could possibly be eligible, um, it's not going to work. But I think the industry... Not going to work financially. Right. I think the industry could still make a reasonable amount of money under some creative financial scheme. So we'll, not my lane, we'll <laughs> see what um, CMS and the payers come up with. Our job is to make sure the companies do the studies, get the data, and I think there's going to be a big role for NIH here in the areas that the industry is not going to cover. And you mentioned, um, you know, there's preliminary, very shaky preliminary evidence that because this is dealing with biological pathways that operate um, in, in the area of addiction, addiction to food. Um, it also looks like it may be helpful in uh, drug addiction, tobacco, et cetera. But we're a long way from having the evidence to know that that's the case. Early days there. I have a couple more questions, but I do want to open it up to the audience that may have some other questions. So we've got folks with microphones who will come around. So raise your hand and they will come to you. I think we have someone over here on this side. Go ahead. Thank you for being here. My question is about digital health and the wild west of tech-enabled um, health uh, solutions and how the FDA is thinking about that. Um, it's a great question, and now we've got large language models to make it even more difficult. <laughs> and, you know, this is an area where you have the um, leaders of the tech giants that are currently out in front in large language models coming to us and saying, please regulate us because we don't know what this thing is going to do. It has tremendous opportunity, but also risk. So we're, um, I think, I feel like our framework when it's making, when AI, so let's divide into categories. Um, AI and digital technologies for making the operations of healthcare better, I think it's going to be the biggest area where we see change very quickly. As a clinician, early in my career, I used to make rounds in an intensive care unit. There were a group of interns and residents who would write the notes. All I had to do was think, make decisions, give feedback to the house staff. It was a great life. And then we got into this thing where even the highest level clinicians are spending 80% of their time typing documentation into a computer. They call it pajama time after you've done yeah. your day. And if you're in the middle of rounds and you can't remember all that stuff in an intensive care unit, you have to do it pretty much in real time, which makes it really, it, it, it causes moral injury because you know you're not doing the best job that you can. Uh, large language models offer the opportunity to fix that. And I think most of us that have been involved in this field believe that's the case. That's not an area for FDA regulation. Um, it's going but to be it could important. be, I and mean, there are people who have talked about it, using it with regard to 
uh, trying to figure out what molecules to go after oh, okay. and in terms right. of the research. All right, so then uh, there's an area of research and drug development. That's also not so much an area for FDA to worry about because um, if you look at drug development, um, you, I mean, you know the statistics, thousands of molecules, a few make it to clinical studies in humans, and out of every 100 that go into clinical studies in humans, uh, less than 15 actually make it to market. And so things get winnowed out. There'll be a lot of ferment in trying to figure out which molecules might be best. I think the business of drug discovery and the science of drug discovery are already moving more quickly because of this. But then we got the area of predictive analytics in a clinical sense. I feel like we have um, at least a framework for, and it's written up in a whole series of guidance that deal with non-AI, just traditional algor mathematical algorithms that are used in medical practice. The thing we're missing in our health system you referred to, and that's this would all work well if we had a system that measured the outcomes of patients over time in a way that went across health systems. Because the way to keep these models in tune is to look at their operating characteristics over time. Or another way of saying it is if you put a model in a living health system and leave it alone for a year, it will not work a year later. Hmm. Because it's very uh, much attuned to the changes in the underlying demographics and clinical characteristics. And also, if you put a model in that's developed on a population, for example, with no people of color, um, or it's an probably, Alzheimer's drug with few women, even though half of the yeah. Alzheimer's patients are women. And so we, if we had a health system that measured outcomes over time, um, so much of this would get better. But then the part that all of us are stumped by right now is generative AI. The large language models get a life of their own. They have a capability of making up stuff, so-called hallucinations. Um, and um, we are all having to work on how to um, regulate that. It's probably going to take a public-private partnership. But even there, I think the real core is we have a health system right now that does not measure health outcomes over time in an aggregate way that allows us to take advantage of the technology and science that we use in all other aspects of business right now. We ought to be using it for good purpose for health instead of just to sell you things on Amazon, but it's very hard to do. Before we go to the next question, if a company uses generative AI in its process, should they reveal that to you? I think um, one idea, which I'm very much in favor of, is having labels for um, AI algorithms just like we have for drugs and devices that gives you the characteristics, how it was tested, what it's good for, and then those who um, develop those models and then accountable for is what you put in your label, um, truthful um, and, uh, and, and not misleading. That, that's a legal standard that's used in a lot of uh, other areas. Because right now, the risk is that every health system will generate its own models. No one will know what's really working. And if you're a clinician seeing a patient every seven minutes, you're going to get sort of used to using it, maybe not for such good. But on the other side of the coin, if you do it right, this could really make a big difference in a positive way. Exactly. Let's see. We heard in the opening regarding repurposing drugs. Do you think that this is really an opportunity? It, it's been around. It isn't new. But do you see new opportunities? I think it's an evergreen opportunity. Um, and it, it cuts in so many different directions, it's hard to give it um, uh, not enough time to go through all parts of it. But, you know, I just say look at colchicine as an example. There's a drug that we thought was relatively dangerous and only useful for short-term use. And given chronically to people who have coronary heart disease, which is a high-risk population, it reduced the rate of death, MI, and stroke. Um, and there's so many other examples. Um, I know uh, uh, David is here who cured his own um, disease after he was almost pronounced dead at my hospital while I was <laughs> practicing there, actually had last rites um, read to him. So um, there's so many examples. But also, um, it, it's a lot like drug discovery in general, I'm afraid, in that most people's good ideas actually won't work. Look at how many repurposed drugs were tried for 
um, uh, for COVID. And a, a real lesson there is you have to do the rigorous studies just like you do for initial drug development if you want to be sure you're not misleading yourself and other people. How many terrible articles were published and how many drugs were sold and used that didn't work or may even cause harm because we didn't have a system that did the right studies? Hmm. Uh, yes. Is that on? Oh, hello. There you go. Hi, Rob. Monica Kraft from uh, uh, Mount Sinai. Good to Hi. see you. Um, I was actually going to ask you a follow up on this drug discovery question. Uh, as somebody who's a clinician, but also in the drug development space, um, what do you think about the law passed by Congress? I believe it was in December, looking at the way that uh, drugs are tested in animal models, especially toxicology for approval. And, and do we have other model systems that could take the place of that? You know, I struggle with that because I'm in a phase two period where I'm looking at that for a therapeutic. And, um, and yes, I want the drug to be safe for patients, obviously. I'd love to minimize animal testing, but I'm not sure that we've got the models that would really be adequate. So I just wondered what your thoughts were. Well, I think we'd all like to see less animal experimentation if we could. Um, but I, I think sometimes our um, excitement about the possibilities exceeds the reality on the ground. So what I'd say is we, we, were, um, we were just so lucky. Our chief scientist at FDA, Naman J. Bumpus, was uh, the unbelievable chair of pharmacology at Hopkins, endowed professorship. And she just said, I want to go into public service. And so mm. came to FDA. You know, her specialty is single, uh, single cell proteomics. Now, I don't know how much work you've done on that. I would be totally out of class <laughs> in thinking about that. I, I don't even know what it is. But, but you know, and uh, so we, we have, a, we have a, a large and growing program in alternative models and how to use them. And we have to close that gap. Now, Monica and I go way back. We were at Duke together for many years. She's used to these kind of insults, but <laughs> academicians tend to do a study and find some association and write a paper saying this will cure everything and the, you know, every <laughs> human condition. But the gap between that possibility and actually proving that a model um, is predictive, that's a big step, translational step that we're not doing a very good job of in our society, I don't think. And uh, frankly, this is why I'm hoping that um, you know, our NIH nominee will get going um, and, and, and get through the process because we need to emphasize this sort of translational medicine right now. Our basic science machine is amazing and, you know, leading the rest of the world. Our translation into practice, I keep saying this over and over, you know, why do I have to call Israel to figure out the next dose of vaccine? They have a system where all the electronic health records are aggregated and they're looking at outcomes in real time. Even Abu Dhabi is looking at outcomes in real time. And why do I have to call the UK to get the clinical trial results? Because they get studies done quickly about the questions that really matter to people. We've got to change these things in this country. Now, again, my um, disclaimer, we have an FDA lane. There I'm accountable for policy. I'm just giving opinions about the other parts of this. Uh, the gentleman over here in the white baseball cap. Is anyone close by? Here you go. The vitamin supplement industry is about 400 billion a year. Why doesn't the FDA monitor it? Um, <laughs> I think a good way. I, I have an easier I, question. If you no, no, that, no, that's actually not a hard question for me, but you may not like the answer. Um, I think the best way to think about the FDA, really, I really mean this seriously, we are umpires. Um, we have a rule book. The rule book are the laws that Congress passes that presumably reflects the will of the American people because these are elected officials. Like good referees in any sport, we have input into the interpretation of the rules, but we don't have input into the basic rule book. Those are congressional laws. And um, our laws related to supplements prohibit us from doing a lot of things that we think we should be doing. We've had requests in the Congress for years to change it. Um, we keep getting defeated by people who have a different point of view. Um, 
And, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a doc. Um, I think whether it's a prescription drug or a supplement, the benefits either outweigh the risks or they don't. Finding out whether the benefits outweigh the risks is actually pretty simple. It's just we have the will to do it, and that's called a clinical trial. But we have no power to require those things pre-market or post-market for supplements. So it's a, just a growing industry. For us to act on a supplement, someone has to report a problem in the post-market for the most part. So we have a whole set of things that we'd like to do, which Congress has not uh, passed into law. So it's a lobbyist issue. Lobbyist. Well, um, you could say it's a lobbyist issue, or you could say maybe there are a lot of Americans who would prefer to buy supplements based on what they believe. And you, I mean, you tell me, the claims that you make about supplements are called structure function claims. My favorite, which I've used over and over because I'm a 71-year-old man, is improves your prostate health. <laughs> you tell me what that means. <laughs> but apparently a lot of Americans like to buy pills because of claims like improves your prostate health. Um, so if, if you want to change- If it's a placebo, and maybe somehow the well, placebo effect does improve their health. I can, I can accept that as a partial argument, but there are a lot of people who don't take medicines that are proven to be effective for diseases because, and remember the supplement industry also gets into the, some of the misinformation crowd, which is sowing misinformation and then selling unproven supplements um, on the side and making a lot of money doing it. So I don't think it's as benign as people say. Having said that, there are probably a lot of supplements that are beneficial. And there's a really interesting randomized trial recently of multivitamins uh, done uh, by the Harvard group that, that seems to indicate it may actually um, slow down the rate of loss of memory, which yeah. as a 71 year old man, I'm also a little concerned <laughs> about that. As someone right on your heels, I am too. But, I, but fundamentally, it's like not hard to say, you compare A and B and you need to do it in a rigorous way and then you know. Then we don't have to argue, we can say A is better than B. We have a couple minutes left and, and I wonder, you, you hit on disinformation and we could talk 45 minutes on that, but do you feel as though there is something the FDA can do or there's a way we can help combat it? I'd say two things. Uh, government can always get better in how um, it handles the issue of misinformation. Um, I mean, number one, um, I, I, I had this thing I'll never forget where I was asked to consult with a pharma CEO roundtable early in my career about clinicaltrials.gov. There was a view that transparency on clinical trials would destroy the business model. And of course, I'm a radical transparency <laughs> in clinical trials person, but the person who preceded me had just been um, advising the tobacco and the oil industries. And his first slide said, if you want people to trust you, you have to act trustworthy. And I think if you look at the research that's being done under, you know, with FDA, it, it, it has so many elements of transparency. You know, clinicaltrials.gov is now the law of the land. You have to uh, make your results available. It's not perfect, but it's very transparent compared to the way it's been. But, and then the second part of it is um, we have to get better and better in how we talk to people. Used to be in the old w world, uh, FDA reviewed the data, said you can market it for this or that, here's the label, and then the information went to the learned intermediaries, mostly doctors, who then were supposed to relay it to patients. Now we all live in a 24 by seven internet world. And of course the problem with the old system was so many people were left out, we didn't pay attention to that. Now everyone has access, but every Tom, Dick, and Harry also has access to the channels to put out all sorts of good and bad information. So we're very much focused where we can in using plain language to try to get concepts across. But the most important point, at least from my perspective, is government is very limited. There's so much mistrust of government now. The science, uh, university, um, community college, high school worlds need to really wake up right now. The anti-science um, trend in the United States is serious and growing by leaps and bounds. And it's very much being fed by combinations of people who have 
different motives, but they're now combined in one mission to undermine um, beliefs and the basic integrity of science. I stress again, point number one is you want to be trusted, act trustworthy. But given that, we, we need a network of people who are not controlled by government, are totally independent of government, but who make it part of their everyday life to combat misinformation. The best way to change someone who's been, let's take a person who says, oh, I don't really, that COVID vaccine. You know, we lost hundreds of thousands of Americans because they were convinced not to take a free vaccine. Uh, Dr. Azar uh, last night said, his number one achievement was warp speed. I think we all think that was phenomenal. But we, um, in many people, we lost the ideological battle, and they died completely unnecessarily. Um, so the number one way to change people like that is through a human personal interaction. So clinicians in the clinic need to ask, what are you, what are you, I'm paying, yeah. you know, listening to? And in our schools and other places, we need to stand up and have courage because it does take courage now because um, when you do stand up, your life is threatened. And we've seen many cases of that recently. Well, did not want to end on such a dour note. <laughs> but it's not dour, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. And let's be hopeful that we can communicate with one another and save more lives. Dr. Caleb, thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. I enjoyed it. Thanks. <laughs>